same face. Okay. Hey guys, my name is Atlas and thank you so much for coming to my channel. Um, I'm going to keep this preamble ramble as quick as possible because we've got a lot to get through. Today we are reading Thumbelina, as you've probably already guessed from the title of this video. And uh, it's longer than the stories I'm used to reading, which is a good thing. Some of you might even be able to relax to it, rather than having 15 minutes of me being sarcastic. Uh, I'm probably also going to try and uh, stop interrupting the flow so often, because Thumbelina, even though I don't really know much about it, uh, feels like it would be quite a good bedtime story. <laughs> so, let's see if I'm able to uh, you know, keep a straight face. Anyway, thanks for coming, and if you enjoy this, please, 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 please do subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comments. Anyway, let's crack on. Thumbelina by Hans Christian Andersen. There was once a woman who wanted so very much, sorry, I've already bunged this up. <laughs> there was once a woman, I have one job, this is my one thing, who wanted so very much to have a tiny little child, but she did not know where to find one. So she went to an old witch and she said, I have my heart set upon having a tiny little child. Please, could you tell me where I can find one? Why, that's easily done, said the witch. Here's a grain of barley for you. But it isn't that sort of barley that farmers grow in their fields, or the chickens get to eat. Put it in a flower pot, and you'll see what you shall see. No, oh, thank you, said the woman. She gave the witch 12 pennies, which is apparently the going rate for barley, and planted the barley seed as soon as she got home. It quickly grew into a fine, large flower, which looked very much like a tulip, but the petals were folded tight as though it was still a bud. This is such a pretty flower, said the woman. She kissed its lovely red and yellow petals, and just as she kissed it, the flower gave a loud pop and flew open. It was a tulip right enough, but on the green cushion in the middle sat a tiny girl. She was dainty and fair to see, but she was no taller than your thumb. So she was called Thumbelina. That makes sense. A nicely polished walnut shell served as her cradle. Her mattress was made of the blue petals of violets, and a rose petal was pulled up to cover her. That was how she slept at night. In the daytime, she played on a table where the woman put a plate surrounded with a wreath of flowers. Their stems lay in the water, on which there floated a large tulip petal. Thumbelina used the petal as a boat and with a pair of white horsehairs for oars, she could row clear across the plate. A charming sight. She could sing too. Her voice was the softest and sweetest that anyone had ever heard. Okay, there's a lot going on. <laughs> First, horsehairs, I've felt them. They are still, they're not that rigid. I would be very surprised if you could row through any water, even if you're an, an inch of a person rowing on a petal. I would be very surprised. Secondly, she is singing so sweetly. She has, her lungs are this big, her voice box even smaller. How is she producing any noise? One, two, that is, you know, pleasant to listen to. Come on. Anyway, sorry, I'm gonna stop picking holes. It's a beautiful story. One night, as she lay in her cradle, 
a horrible toad hopped in through the window. One of the planes, planes? One of the panes was broken. This big, ugly, slimy toad. Where have I, ooh, where's my place? I've lost my place. Ah, this big, ugly, slimy toad jumped right down on the table where Thumbelina was asleep under the red rose petal. Here is a perfect wife for my son, the toad exclaimed. She seized upon the walnut shell in which Thumbelina lay asleep and hopped off with it out the window and into the garden. A big broad stream ran through it with a muddy marsh along its banks and here the toad lived with her son. Ugh. He was just like his mother, slimy and horrible. Coax, coax, rick was all that he could say when he saw the graceful little girl in the walnut shell. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how that's supposed to be said. To those who uh, have had this read to them as kids, please can you let me know how your uh, parents or whomever said that. Coax, coax, wreck a kick a kick. Don't speak too loud or you will wake her up, the old toad told him. She might get away from us yet, for she is as light as a puff of swans down. We must put her on one of the broad water lily leaves out in the stream. She is so small and light that it will be just like an island to her. And she can't run away from us while we are making our best room under the mud, ready for you two to live in. Many water lilies with broad green leaves grew in the stream, and it looked as if they were floating on the surface. The leaf that lay furthest from the bank was the largest of them all, and it was to this leaf that the old toad swam with the walnut shell that held Thumbelina. The poor little thing woke up early the next morning, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry bitterly. There was water all around the big green leaf, and there was no way for her to reach the shore. Why doesn't she pick up a hair and try and motor the leaf to the shore? Don't know. The old toad sat in the mud, decorating a room with green rushes and yellow water lilies to have it looking its best for her new daughter-in-law. Then she and her ugly son swam out to the leaf on which Thumbelina was standing. They came for her pretty little bed, which they wanted to carry to the bridal chamber before they took her there. Would the toad fit in that bed? Why do they want it? Let's see. The old toad curtsied deeply in the water before her. That's nice. And said... Meet my son. He is to be your husband, and you will share a delightful home in the mud. Coax, coax, break a kick a kick, was all that her son could say. What a charmer. Then they took the pretty little bed and swam away with it. Left all alone on the green leaf, Thumbelina sat down and cried. She did not want to live in the slimy toad's house. It didn't want to have the toad's horrible son for her husband. The toad's son's taking a lot of heavy hits so far. The little fishes who swam in the water. Why am I doing that? I have animations to do that. <laughs> who swam in the water beneath her had seen the toad and heard what she had said. So up popped their heads to have a look at the little girl. No sooner had they seen her than they felt very sorry that anyone so pretty should have to go and live with that horrible toad. No, that should never be. They gathered around the green stem that held the leaf where she was and gnawed it in two with their teeth. Away went the leaf down the stream and away went Thumbelina. Far away, where the toad could not catch her. Great. Thumbelina sailed past many a place. <laughs> this picture of her sort of having fastened a sail to this leaf and is now sort of staring it like a masterful pro. 
When the little birds in the bushes saw her, they sang, What a darling little girl. The leaf drifted further and further away with her, and so it was that Thumbelina became a traveller. A lovely white butterfly kept fluttering around her, and at last alighted on the leaf because he admired Thumbelina. She was a happy little girl again, now that the toad could not catch her. And it was all very lovely as she floated along. And where the sun struck the water, it looked like shining gold. Thumbelina undid her sash, tied one end of it to the butterfly, and made the other end fast to the leaf. It went much faster now, and Thumbelina went much faster too. For, of course, she was standing on it. <laughs> Just then, a big maybug flew by <laughs> and caught sight of her. Immediately, he fastened his claws around her slender waist and flew up with her into a tree. Away went the green leaf down the stream, and away went the butterfly with it, for he was tied to the leaf and could not get loose. Oh no! <laughs> The butterfly is going to die. What have you done, Thumbelina? My goodness. <laughs> How frightened little Thumbelina was when the maybug carried her up into the tree. But she was even more sorry for the nice white butterfly she had fastened to the leaf. Because if he couldn't free himself, he would have to starve to death. <laughs> but the maybug wasn't one to care about that. He sat her down on one of the largest green leaves of the tree, fed her honey from the flowers, and told her how pretty she was, considering she didn't look like, least like, a maybug. Yeah, I bet she's forgotten about the butterfly now. That's lovely treatment. After a while, all the other maybugs who lived in the tree came to pay them a call. As they stared at Thumbelina, the lady maybugs threw up their feelers and said, Why? She only has two legs. What a miserable sight. She hasn't any feelers, one cried. She is pinched in at the waist. How shameful. She looks like a human being. How ugly she is, all of the female Maybug said. Yet Thumbelina was as pretty as ever. Even the Maybug, who had flown away with her, knew that. But as every last one of them kept calling her ugly... He at length came to agree with them and would have nothing to do with her. She could go wherever she chose. They flew down out of the tree with her and left her on a daisy where she sat and cried because she was so ugly that the Maybugs wouldn't have anything to do with her. God, this whole story so far is just about how pretty Thumbelina is. What happened to the butterfly? I want to know. Nevertheless, she was the loveliest little girl you can imagine, and as frail and fine as the petal of a rose. All summer long, poor Thumbelina lived all alone in the woods. She wove herself a hammock of grass and hung it under a big burdock leaf to keep off the rain. She took honey from the flowers for food and drank the dew that had found its way onto the leaf every morning. In this way, the summer and fall went by. Then came the winter, the long, cold winter. All the birds who had sung so sweetly for her flew away. The tree and the flowers withered. The big burdock leaf, under which she had lived, shriveled up, and nothing was left of it but a dry, yellow stalk. She was terribly cold, for her clothes had worn threadbare, and she herself was so slender and frail. Bragging? Poor Thumbelina. She would freeze to death. Snow began to fall, and every time a snowflake struck her, it was as if she had been hit by a whole shovelful, for we are quite tall, while she measured only an inch. So, I like how the narrator's, not the narrator, the author has put himself in the book. She wrapped a withered leaf around her, but there was no warmth in it, 
She shivered with cold. Near the edge of the woods, where she had now arrived, was a large grain field. But the grain had been harvested long ago. Only the dry, bare stubble stuck out of the frozen ground. It was just as if she was lost in a vast forest, and oh, how she shivered with cold. Then she came to the door of a field mouse who had a little hole among the stubble. There this mouse lived, warm and cosy, with a whole storeroom of grain and a magnificent kitchen and pantry. Poor Thumbelina stood at the door, just like a beggar child, and pled for a little bit of barley, because she hadn't had anything to eat for two days past. Why, you poor young thing, said the field mouse, who turned out to be a kind-hearted old creature. You must come into my warm room and share my dinner. She took such a fancy to Thumbelina that she said, If you care to, you may stay with me all winter, but you must keep my room tidy and tell me stories, for I am very fond of them. Meta. Thumbelina did as the kind old field mouse asked, and she had a very good time of it. Soon we shall have a visitor. The field mouse said, Once every week my neighbour comes to see me, and he is even better off than I am. His rooms are large, and he wears a beautiful black velvet coat. If you could only get him for a husband, you would be well taken care of. But he can't see anything. You must tell him the very best stories you know. Thumbelina did not like this suggestion. She would not even consider the neighbour because he was a mole. That seems racist or somethingist. He paid them a visit in his black velvet coat. The field mouse talked about how wealthy and wise he was and how his home was more than 20 times larger than hers. But for all of his knowledge, he cared nothing at all for the sun and the flowers. He had nothing good to say about them, for he had never laid eyes on them, because he's blind. As Thumbelina had to sing for him, she sang, Maybug, Maybug, Fly Away Home, that famous ditty, and The Monk Goes Afield, by Ariana Grande. The mole fell in love with her sweet voice, but he didn't say anything about it just yet for he was a most discreet fellow. He had just dug a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs, and the field mouse and Thumbelina were invited to use it whenever they pleased, although he warned them not to be alarmed by the dead bird that lay in this passage. It was a complete bird with feather and beak. It must have died quite recently when winter set in, and was buried right in the middle of the tunnel. The mole took in his mouth a torch of decayed wood. In the darkness it glimmered like fire. He went ahead of them to light the way through the long, dark passage. How is it doing that if it's not actually lit? When they came to where the dead bird lay, the mole put his broad nose to the ceiling and made a large hole through which daylight could fall. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, with his lovely wings folded in at his side and his head tucked under his feathers. The poor bird must certainly have died of the cold. Thumbelina felt so sorry for him. She loved all the little birds who had sung so sweetly and sweetly twittered to her all through the summer. Insert dead joke about Twitter existing back then. We can workshop it. But the mole gave the body a kick with his short stumps and said, now he won't be chirping anymore. <laughs> what a wretched thing it is to be born a little bird. Thank goodness none of my children can be a bird who is nothing but his chirp chirp and must starve to death when winter comes along. He's husband material, isn't he? Yes, you are so right, you sensible man, 
the field mouse agreed. What good is all his chirp chirping to a bird in the winter time when he starves and freezes? But that's considered very grand, I imagine. What cynical, horrible old fogies. Thumbelina kept silent. But when the others had turned their back on the bird, she bent over, smoothed aside the feathers that hid the bird's head, and kissed his closed eyes. Maybe it was he who sang so sweetly to me in the summertime, she thought to herself. What pleasure he gave me, the sweet, dear, pretty bird. The mole closed up the hole that let in the daylight, and then he took the ladies home. That night, Thumbelina could not sleep a wink. So she got up and wove a fine, large coverlet out of hay. She took it to the dare bird and spread it over him so that he would lie warm in the cold earth. She tucked him in with some soft thistle down that she had found in the field mouse's room. Goodbye, you pretty little bird, she said. Goodbye and thank you for your sweet songs last summer. When the trees were all green, and the sun shone so warmly upon us. She laid her head on his breast, and it startled her to feel a soft thump, as if something was beating inside. This was the bird's heart. He was not dead, he was only numb with cold, and now he had been warmed, he came to life again. In the fall... All swallows fly off to warm countries, but if one of them starts too late, he gets so cold and he drops down as if he were dead and lies where he fell, and then the snow cold covers him. Thumbelina was so frightened that she trembled, for the bird was so big, so enormous compared to her own inch of height. But she mustered her courage, tucked the cotton wool down closer around the poor, poor bird, brought the mint leaf that covered her own bed and spread it over the bird's head. The following night, she tiptoed out to him again. He was alive now, but so weak that he could barely open his eyes for a moment to look at Thumbelina, who stood beside him with the piece of touchwood that was her only lantern. Again, an unli unlit piece of wood serving as a lantern. How confusing! Thank you, pretty little child, the sick swallow said. I have been wonderfully warmed. Soon I shall get strong once more and be able to fly again in the warm sunshine. Oh, she said, it's cold outside and snowing and freezing. You just stay in your bed and I'll nurse you. She then brought him some water in the petal of a flower. The swallow drank and told her how he had hurt one of his wings in a thorn bush, and for that reason couldn't fly as fast as the other swallows when they flew far, far away to the warm countries. Finally, he had dropped to the ground. It was all he remembered, and he had no idea how he came to be where she found him. The swallow stayed there all through the winter, and Thumbelina was kind to him, and tended to him with loving care. She didn't say anything about this to the field mouse or to the mole, because they did not like the poor, unfortunate swallow. As soon as spring came, and the sun warmed the earth, the swallow told Thumbelina it was time to say goodbye. She reopened the hole that the mole had made in the ceiling, and the sun shone in splendour upon them. The swallow asked Thumbelina to go with him. She could sit on his back as they flew through the green woods. But Thumbelina knew that it would make the old field mouse feel badly if she left like that. So she said, no, I cannot go. Fare you well, fare you well, my good and pretty girl, said the swallow as he flew into the sunshine. Tears came to Thumbelina's eyes as she watched him go, for she was so fond of the poor swallow. Chirp, chirp, sang the bird as he flew into the green woods. Thumbelina felt very downcast. She was not permitted to go out into the warm sunshine. Moreover, 
The grain that was sown in the field above the field mouse's house grew so tall that, to a poor little girl who was only an inch high, it was like a dense forest. You must work on your trousseau this summer, the field mouse said. It's not a word you hear often these days. For their neighbour, that loathsome mole in his black velvet coat, had proposed to her. You must have both woolens and linens, both bedding and wardrobe when you become the mole's wife. Thumbelina had to turn the spindle. <laughs> it's a throwback for dedicated viewers. And the field mouse hired four spiders to spin and weave for her day and night. The mole came to call every evening. And his favourite remark was that the sun, which now baked the earth as hard as a rock, would not be nearly so hot when summer was over. That's his favourite remark. Yes, as soon as summer was past, he would be marrying Thumbelina. But she was not at all happy about it, because she didn't like the tedious mole the least bit. Neither do we. Every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, she would steal out the door. When the breeze blew the ears of grain apart, she could catch glimpses of the blue sky. She could dream about how bright and fair it was out of doors, and how she wished she would see her dear swallow again. What about the butterfly? Is it just me? <laughs> it's just me thinking about when the butterfly is coming back. Anyway, but he did not come back, the swallow, for doubtless he was far away, flying about in the lovely green woods. When fall arrived, Thumbelina's whole trousseau was ready. Your wedding day is four weeks off, the field mouse told her. But Thumbelina cried and declared that she would not have the tedious mole for a husband. Fiddlesticks, said the field mouse. Don't you be obstinate, or I'll bite you with my white teeth. Oh, God. <laughs> She's gone full, Sith Lord. Why, you're getting a superb husband. The queen herself hasn't a black velvet coat as fine as his. She won't shut up about it. Both his kitchen and his cellar are well supplied. You ought to thank goodness that you are getting him. Then came the wedding day. The mole had come to take Thumbelina home with him, where she would have to live deep underground and never go out in the warm sunshine ever again. Because he disliked it so. The poor little girl felt very sad that she had to say goodbye to the glorious sun, which the field mouse had at least let her look out through the doorway. Farewell, bright sun, she said. With her arm stretched towards it, she walked a little way from the field mouse's home. The grain had been harvested, and only the dry stubble was left in the field. Farewell, farewell, she cried again, and flung her little arms around a red flower that was still in bloom. If you see my dear swallow, please give him my love. <laughs> Has she gone insane? <laughs> it's a flower. Oh, well, I guess, you know, she's talking to animals. Who knows what, what works in this world? Chirp, 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 chirp. She suddenly heard a twittering over her head. She looked up and there was the swallow just passing by. He was so glad to see Thumbelina. Although, when she told him how she hated to marry the mole and live deep underground when the sun never shone, she could not hold back her tears. Now that the cold winter is coming, the swallow told her, I shall fly far, far away to the warm countries. Won't you come along with me? You can ride on my back. Just tie yourself on with the sash. Because that worked out so well for the butterfly. And away we'll fly. Far from the ugly mole and his dark hole. <laughs> far, far away over the mountains to the warm countries where the sun shines so much fairer than hair, to where it is always summer 
and there are always flowers. Please fly away with me, dear little Thumbelina, you who saved my life when I, f when I lay frozen in a dark hole in the earth. Yes, I will go with you, <laughs> said Thumbelina. She sat on his back, put her feet on his outstretched wings, and fastened her sash to one of his strongest feathers. Then the swallow soared into the air over forests and over lakes, high up over the ground, the great mountains that are always capped with snow. When Thumbelina felt cold in the chill air, she crept under the bird's warm feathers, with only her little head stuck out to watch all the wonderful sights below. At length, they came to the warm countries. There, the sun shone far more brightly than it ever does here, and the sky seemed twice as high. Again, the author has sort of just put himself in the story, and it ever does here. Where are we? <laughs> Along the ditches and hedgerows grew marvellous green and blue grapes. Lemons and oranges hung in the woods. The air smelled sweetly of myrtle and thyme. By the wayside, the loveliest children ran hither and thither, playing with the brightly coloured butterflies. Well, not the butterfly that we came to know and love. But the swallow flew on still farther and became more and more beautiful. Under magnificent green trees on the shore of a blue lake, there stood an ancient palace of dazzling white marble. The lofty pillars were wreathed with vines, and at the top of them many swallows had made their nests. One nest belonged to the swallow who carried Thumbelina. This is my home, the swallow said to her. If you will choose one of these glorious flowers in bloom down below, I shall place you in it, and you will have all that your heart desires. That will be lovely, she cried and clapped her tiny hands. A great white marble pillar had fallen to the ground, where it lay in three broken pieces. Between these pieces grew the loveliest large white flowers. The swallow flew down with Thumbelina and put on one of the large petals. No, sorry, put her on one of the large petals, because that makes more sense. How surprised she was to find in the centre of the flower a little man, as shining and transparent as if he had been made of glass. On his head was the daintiest of little crowns, on his shoulders were the brightest shining wings, and he was not a bit bigger than Thumbelina. He was the spirit of the flower, in every flower there lived a small man or woman just like him, but he was the king over all of them. Oh, isn't he handsome, Thumbelina said softly to the swallow. The king was somewhat afraid of the swallow, which seemed a very giant of a bird to anyone as small as he. But when he saw Thumbelina, he rejoiced, for she was the prettiest little girl he had ever laid eyes on. Again, this whole book is just about how pretty Thumbelina is. So, he took off his golden crown and put it on her head. He asked if he might know her name, and he asked her to be his wife, which would make her queen over all the flowers. Here indeed was a different sort of husband from the toad's son and the mole with his black velvet coat. So she said yes to this charming king. From all the flowers trooped little ladies and gentlemen, delightful to behold. Every one of them brought Thumbelina a present, but the best gift of all was a pair of wings that had belonged to a large silver fly. What happened to the fly? When these were made fast to her back, she too could flit from flower to flower. Everyone rejoiced as the swallow perched above them in his nest and sang the very best songs for them. <laughs> What's the bet? It's just Wonderwall on repeat. <laughs> and then closing time. He was sad though, deep down in his heart, for he liked Thumbelina so much that he wanted never to part with her. You shall no longer be called Thumbelina, 
the flower spirit told her. That name is too ugly for anyone as pretty as you are. We shall call you Maya. Where's her say? <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, said the swallow. He flew away again from the warm countries back to faraway Denmark, where he had a little nest over the window of the man who can tell you fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen has written himself into the book. Cheeky devil. To him, the, burn, the bird sang chirp, 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 chirp. And that is how we heard the whole story. Who's we? <laughs> Presumably it's just him. That was far more of a bedtime story than any of the ones I've told so far because of how little torture and massacre there is in it. Apart from the butterfly. <laughs> what happened to the butterfly? Am I the only one who wants to know? Justice for the butterfly. Make it a hashtag that is trending. Um, also, the mother at the beginning of the story, she, uh, her, her story arc uh, just sort of gets cut, cut off there as Thumbelina becomes a sailing traveller. That was awesome. Um, anyway, I hope uh, that none of you are watching this because you are either fast asleep or comatosed with relaxation. Um, but if you are still with me, Thank you so much for watching this video. It's been a blast. And uh, if you liked it, please like, comment, subscribe. Um, I would love to hear from you. Until next time, have a great week. See ya.